Um, I'm somebody who experienced um, a paradigm shift in a very physical way. <laughs> Studying geophysics, or no, no, the geosciences in the mid-1970s, we had a thick book by Arthur Holmes, the book on structural geology. Uh, we were supposed to read edition eight. I went to the used bookshop and bought edition two, not knowing that that was written before plate tectonics had become an accepted theory in geology. <laughs> so plate tectonics was simply dismissed on half a page, saying this is a very naive and speculative theory, we don't waste any time. Luckily, I read a popular science uh, journal uh, a few days before the exam, so I just made it. So, um, yeah, do you find my presentation? Yeah. So I will now pose some questions to you. Um, and I would start by a short introduction, because um, I try to be very structured here. And uh, because I will moderate a discussion at the end of, of this day as well. So this is the first part. And if we get the technology working. OK. OK. Um, so the idea is that now we will talk about scientific, the science. The sort of, of the obstacles to what I think Alan, Kate, and somebody else um, coined advanced interdisciplinarity in their evaluation or the assessment of the Pufendorf Institute. So advanced interdisciplinarity, they call that is when you try to um, create interdisciplinary knowledge across ontological divides and ontological and epistemological divides. So it's much more challenging than, let's say, having a, a biologist and a, a, a physicist or a chemist working together. They probably share sort of ontological views. So across, let's say, the natural sciences and the social sciences. So this uh, morning we'll talk about the scientific obstacles, if there are such, and the next discussion will be on the administrative. Um, so, um, ontological differences, that is, what exists? What is, what is the world? Does it exist, or is it just constructed when, whenever we try to observe it? So some of you probably see um, a young, chick person, and some of you probably see a much older and not-so-chick person. So, what exists? Um, and are there competing paradigms? So, what I have found out in uh, working for many years across the natural and social sciences is that natural scientists and social scientists, they have fundamental ways of misunderstanding each other. So most natural scientists will not accept that there are competing parallel paradigms. They want to see one paradigm after the other, just like I experienced when I realized my book was, my, my textbook was, was, was um, published before plate tectonics. Um, um, and a very short anecdote, I was trying to discuss the reasons for tropical deforestation with a group of ecologists a few years ago. And they all the time challenged me, saying that, but social science, you haven't come up with a good explanation. I said, there are many different ex explanations. Um, and I said, there is at least three groups of them. There is a Durkheimian explanation, there is a Weberian explanation, and there is a Marxist explanation. And they say, okay, so you haven't found out which one is right. It's sometimes uh, absolutely impossible to, to, to get a natural scientists to understand that there are competing paradigms and they will probably always uh, be there. I've also figured out that um, uh, um, many natural scientists who has, when they become in, uh, interested in society, they adopt some kind of a what in sociology we will call consensus theory, that society is a place where people come together and they, they listen to each other and they create consensus and that's the way the society works on, sort of develops um, in a rather harmonious way, which means that there is room for science. If you can, can just get into that conversation, you can actually give rational 
arguments for changing the politics. While most social scientists, I would say, they have some kind of conflict perspective. Society is a place which develops in relation to conflict of interest, clashes of interest, and is the most powerful who will win and dominate and so forth. And of course, in that view, science has much less role to play. Uh, so there are a number of... So my question, I have two questions to you. Um, so the first one is, to what extent is it possible to overcome such deep-seated or, or sort of ontol um, differences at the ontological level that I think is necessary in advanced interdisciplinarity? To what extent is it possible? The second question is, how? Are there, what are the most optimistic ways that we can uh, apply? Um, and in this second question, I will actually uh, start asking Michael first, because you have spent all your 30 minutes trying to explain how wonderful it is and how possible it is using a, a toolbox. So I would like you to start. <laughs> what are the limits to the toolbox if you have this situation where there is a, 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 a group of, of ecologists and a group of social, uh, sociologists that cannot agree about so, why so there is tropical deforestation. Could you solve that with the toolbox? Do you mind if I answer your question with a question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what do you mean by overcome? So that you can have a constructive dialogue. You can have a structure. You can, you can each learn something. Sure. Yeah, I, 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 I do think that it's... Well, let's put it this way, uh, independently of the toolbox. I think it happens that collaborators with very different ways of thinking about how knowledge is constituted um, figure out how to work together and combine ideas and develop integrated uh, products, inter integrated you know, um, manuscripts, integrated uh, responses to research questions. Um, and you know, that happens when you're you know, you might have an artist, a humanist, a social scientist, and a physicist, right, that working together in ways that, that um, uh, involve identifying points of contact, um, I think, and, and, and taking advantage of those points of contact for the purposes of developing something together that, that looks and feels quite integrated. I think that happens. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that while interdisciplinarity is difficult, it is successful from time to time. Okay, right. I will challenge you further. I mean, okay. uh, this is the time for me to be rude. Yeah, uh, yeah, when yeah, you so start to so ramble, I will, I will have no, no, no mercy. <laughs> so, I, I don't doubt it can work. Okay. But tell us about spectacular failure. Tell about a spectacular... Spectacular failure. Failure. Um. When you have really worked hard to get people trying to have a constructive dialogue, and it has failed. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, now I'll just talk about toolbox workshops. I'm, it's I'm <laughs> embarrassing to admit more than a few to choose from. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's um, one of the things that has been discussed, uh, I think, maybe yesterday, certainly at the session that Hannah and Henrik organized, was the importance of trust. And um, we found that in... Uh, when we work with teams where the power dynamic is is um, manifest in a way that undermines the ability of people involved to trust one another, then um, the kind of dialogue we're trying to design, which is intended to to highlight differences of exactly the sort you're 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 pointing to, right? Differences in w the way of think in, in ways of thinking about what um, what knowledge is and can be, right? Um, the Precisely this kind of thing. If if you get a group of people around the table who don't trust one another, mm. right? Then that has two trust effect. because there are different seniorities. Uh, sort of, there is the professor and the student. Could be that, or because they come from different it could disciplinary be that. backgrounds. Okay. <laughs> it okay. could be it could be that, that there's something like disciplinary chauvinism at work, yeah. where it's it's very clear that the person across the table from me doesn't respect what I do. Okay, and so as a consequence, I, I'm not really interested in in exposing myself to criticism by talking mm. to him. Um, or, you know, them. And um, it could be that there's a social power, right? Yeah. That I'm a graduate student and I'm in, in a, a context with my advisor and, and I don't want to say things that, that put me at risk in various ways in front of my advisor. So it could be, it could be a... 
you so know, you think so Uskal is worse? There are assholes and and um, and uh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> that that matters. Yeah, it I, does. Do. Okay. I do. It's cert we've yeah. certainly seen it matter in yeah. ways that have undermined workshops. Yeah. So, others start with Suna. To what extent can we overcome? Differences at the ontological level between social yeah, sciences. To what extent is advanced who, interdisciplinarity who's possible? Who, who's we? Uh, we, uh, um, the scientific community. Wait, as we, as uh, what I call the academic citizens, uh, I think that uh, we'll have to go back to um, to uh, some fundamental uh, concepts that uh, the we, audience is here. Hmm? The audience is here. Oh, I thought it was you. I'm <laughs> sorry. That's why I tried to move here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, um, I, was, uh, I, was, I was just concentrating on you, Lana. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we go, if we go back to some, of some fundamental concepts that were, that were given by uh, Finnish uh, sociologist and philosopher called Antti Eskola, if you remember him, he was uh, his fundamental uh, his fundamental concept were you have to be near or close or and you have to be alike so what you have to create uh, uh, if you're if you're if you're interested if you're curious and if you respect the people you speak with you have to enter in a process of creating closeness and in a way, <coughs> ways to be alike. For instance, be alike in, in the uh, uh, conviction that there is a certain problem that you are very, very interested in to study or solve, maybe, but study. And if you, if you, can, if you, can, if you can give people w with that interest place, time and space to do it, well, that's the best thing we can do. Okay. So with time, we can. Then I will modify a little bit question. Because I can see there are perhaps two main suggestions for how to overcome such um, big differences in scientific uh, viewpoint. One is a long-term co-evolution. Um, but of course, that is very hard in a funding landscape where you're supposed to come up with the, with the result after three, three or four years. And you may miss out on timely topics. The other way is, of course, to pick the ones that are interested to work on interdisciplinary, in interdisciplinary um, settings. But then there's a risk, of course, that you miss the best ones. So, Hanne, Uskali or Elizabeth, who would like to start? How do you have any particular ideas for how, how to overcome differences at the ontological level? I don't know if I have any ways of overcoming. I have an example from our work. We were having the presentation about robotics and artificial intelligence, and we ended up discussing, are computers really intelligent? And mm -hmm. the technical people in the group that have some kind of understanding of how computers work and how these robots are programmed, obviously it's artificial, it's not real intelligence. But the other people thought, of course, they can be the intelligence. So we ended up, after a long discussion, we ended up that, oh, yes, we are not in agreement about what intelligence means. Okay. So we need to yeah. define what intelligence means. So we had these basic sort of different understandings of what the word meant. And we went back to really philosophical questions about what is it to have an intelligent tool. <laughs> So I'm not okay. answering your question, I'm just giving you an example. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, then I would say, this is yeah. perhaps like swearing in, in church, because um, I hope I don't offend anybody here, but, <laughs> but you didn't really um, achieve anything. You had yeah. a very nice and interesting journey, but what did you achieve? Did you achieve sort of a new scientific knowledge that, was, that wasn't there before, so to speak, or did you just have a very nice journey? I would say we achieved something, yes. Okay, good. good. <laughs> you can read the book. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. We found a number of topics and themes that are interesting, yeah. 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 Yes. The That's discussion about intelligent tools, I don't think we ever really agreed. We just agreed that we didn't really understand each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. Over time, maybe we would yeah. have reached a common understanding, mm -hmm. and maybe 
with some more under uh, teaching about what does it mean to program a robot, maybe the non-technical okay. people would have got it, possibly, maybe. Hmm. And maybe with some more philosophical discussions, the technical people would have gained a bigger understanding of maybe it's about defining the term and discussing okay. what do we mean about hmm. intelligent tools. So. Oscar Lee. Yeah, if you thought, uh, think of, of your image here, and maybe a couple of thoughts about that. <coughs> First of all, what happens around that negotiation table? Nat we have natural scientists and social scientists there. And what about the role of consensus? I mean, studies actually show that the natural scientists suppress their disagreements. They appear as, as if they are in consensus with one another, whereas the social scientists have a difficulty with hiding their disagreements. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, we know that consensus goes with uh, scientific authority, prestige, and those kinds of things. The more we have consensus, the more confident we can be that we have gotten it right. And so that's, uh, there is a an nice asymmetry uh, right, right here. Uh, the other observation has to do with uh, what society is like and what beliefs natural scientists on the one hand and what social scientists half about that uh, society in, in, out there in, in reality. Uh, I mean, nature or natu the natural physical world is different from, from the social world in that it's far easier for us to accept that this table here has certain manifest properties that are not really the, the root of the thing. I mean, we accept the, the physicist so story about what these table are, are tables are made of, atoms and, and the rest of it. Whereas regarding society, the common sense conception of society and the scientific conception of society need to quarrel with one another continuously. And it's far harder to accept that there is something hidden there behind that common sense conception. The common sense conception is uh, based on the idea of small scale uh, organized activity amongst a small number of people. And that's what the natural scientists are entertaining. That's their uh, idea of society, social, social structure and they project it to, to the larger uh, scale and therefore they are misled by, by, by this uh, uh, affinity between the common sense and scientific conception of society. I would say if, if we want uh, sort of, uh, more agreement or more uh, interaction and, and uh, uh, closer understanding between natural and social scientists, we need to educate natural scientists some social science and also tell them that they shouldn't even go to the, go and uh, vote in, in political e elections without taking courses in social sciences, <laughs> because they don't understand society. That's, this is one reason, by the way, why business leaders make bad prime ministers. They don't understand society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have a particular person in mind, or? Many. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK, um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. But, but uh, Hannah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll follow up on, on Uskala's lead and, and talk about education. I would say that are here some symmetries also necessary that yes, we need to educate natural scientists in more in social science and humanities and vice versa, make sure that people from humanities and social sciences <laughs> are more aware are of what goes on in the natural sciences. I think what's important is to focus on or th these, how, how much is necessary to have this kind of communication. And basically, I think, in a lot of debate, we have talked about boundary objects and, and the plasticity and the elasticity. What we need to focus on is to make sure that people understand each other's constraints, that you understand enough, as a natural scientist, you understand enough of social science to understand that, that there are constraints to views in the same, the same in, in the other direction. Or, Added to the educational aspect, then also comes the, the, the hierarchy and, and the power aspect. Are some are more likely to engage in education than others? Or are those who are on top of the power gain may not see the same kind of necessity or in, in being educated in that direction? Or how to solve that? Or is a completely different question, which I won't start on here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will also... Um, like to um, collect some questions from, from the audience after a while, but I will, while you think, I will pose uh, another question to, to the panel here. And it's about the Pufendorf non-model. <laughs> um, 
and that is, so I think, what Uskal referred to in his question to, to Michael, um, this more radical sort of m melting down of disciplinary boundaries and creating something new. It, during um, a typical Pilfendorf theme, you have eight months to have a nice journey, discuss, hopefully something very scientific comes out of it. If that is really successful, should that result in a more long-lasting melting, me melting pot? Or what happens when we go back to our disciplines? So should we change our disciplines so they are better working interdisciplinary? Or should we actually take the step of creating these new interdisciplinary um, centers or whatever? New centers, new, new disciplines? No, well, I don't know. Actually. Places. Places. Spaces. Spaces that are more than just uh, ad hoc um, discussion groups. But, you know, the really good theme groups are not ad hoc groups. They're sort of, they have roots. They have uh, tents and they, they have... Uh, they have their own histories, so it's, it's, it's not really fair to just call them ad hoc groups, even okay. if they appear for us, or for you, for anyone. I, you know, you're, in, in, you're into the business yourself now. So. But uh, as maybe, as it were, ad hoc groups. But if you, wh what we hope for it is that, the, 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 since we believe that they are not ad hoc groups, and they, they have, uh, have some history, have some roots. Uh, we're, we're strengthening the ways these people have time and really find out what they're, what, what, how could they get closer to what the other one, the other people mean, and how could we so sort of be united when it comes to certain certain problem areas that we can define. In or do you create um, very frustrated scientists who have had this wonderful opportunity of, of thinking big and then have, have to go back to their disciplines yes, yes, and thinking yes. small again? It's yes, we do. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, is that a danger that you think? No, of? no, but it, that it happens, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. 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 We have some of them here in the audience. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else uh, sort of would like to say something on, on this? Should we actually take the step further from the ad hoc discussions to melting down. Yeah, I mean, you are about to do yeah, it. That yeah, yeah exactly. Right that, that's also what we discussed yesterday a little bit. I, I think I see great risks in, in, in going too far in interdisciplining, interdisciplining uh, the science system as a whole. I mean, in order for interdisciplinarity to be successful, we need strong disciplines. We should not weaken disciplines. So if, if we want to be interdiscipli interdisciplinary, we want to be, we should be pro-disciplinary at the same time rather than anti-disciplinary. So uh, pro-disciplinary interdisciplinarity is the way to go. And, and that, that, because these ad hoc, short-term, small-scale interdisciplinary encounters, of course, should be facilitated, uh, etc. That's what you are doing. But I, I'm not sure if in your toolbox you have the tools for understanding and uh, designing the larger institutional structures of the science system as a whole. But no, I'm opposed to that because if... if uh, the audience really is here. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. To him. I'm you have to look both sides. <laughs> you know that 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 uh, uh, actually, when uh, when disciplines are obsolete, they wane, and uh, very often it's it's uh, some kind of down from bo bottom up uh, interdisciplinarity that we don't see as such that that uh, makes them obsolete. Are you go, do you want to strengthen the, the uh, uh, discipline of uh, anatomy, for instance? Do you, do you think we should have more professors in anatomy in, in our modern universities? Or histology or physiology? Just to take three very famous and very taken for granted 
uh, disciplines as, as I saw them when I was a young boy. And they waned. They're away. The disciplinary structure of, of uh, science is not uh, stable. No, it's Eternal, not stable. nothing like and that. Then, it will then change. Sometimes it's really the work, the, ru the, the, the destructive work of, of interdisciplinarity that makes them obsolete. Mm -hmm. Yeah? A short before we invite the audience. Um, I, I'm kind of a pluralist, I guess, in general. And I, so I tend to be a pluralist about the relationship between interdisciplinarity and disciplinarity. And one of the things I'm especially interested in, my current role, is just creating opportunities for people to thrive in the, in the academy. And there will always be people, it seems to me, who are inclined to want to work across disciplines. And there are other people who are going to be more passionate about questions that are that are defined and delimited by disciplinary boundaries, and it, it seems to me unreasonable to 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 move hard in one direction or the other, uh, because what that does is disenfranchise um, folks who have lots to contribute. And if only the culture was was conducive to their contributions. So I, I I'm kind of in, in favor of being a, more of a pluralist. The second thing, um, I I I, th I think. It, Uskali's right that the toolbox isn't really focused on level two stuff, but I'm also kind of of the opinion that that there's a relationship between level two and level one, and to the, to the extent that it makes sense to talk at this more general in this more general way of what, about what happens here between economics and geography, say, um, has a lot to do with probably causally with what happens in between economists and geographers, right, in specific projects, and so I. I I, I don't know what that, I, I'm not suggesting that's necessarily a reductivist relationship, but I, mm -hmm. I think there's, I, I'd be really shocked if this happened in a way that was just completely independent of what's happening down here. So I think there's a lot to learn from here for, yeah. Shall we invite the audience? Nobody accepts the invitation. Yes, somebody. Hello, I'm uh, um, from a funding agency, uh, Formas, in Sweden. Uh, and I'm very curious about how you feel about what we should do. What's our role? Should we stimulate interdisciplinary research by have specific calls? Or should we not do that? Uh, since uh, we heard a lot about uh, the important stuff is the journey. And as a funding agency, we focus very lot of the output. We give you three years, and then we have a specific uh, aim of a large output. Should we instead focus on giving you better terms, like having longer funding periods? Or should we uh, stimulate the networks or that kind of things? So where, where do the funding agency come in, and, and should we come in? to kind of uh, stimulate the interdisciplinary research. This is a really pertinent and important question, which we should also come back to in the, in the, um, last, in, in, in the final discussion, where we're talking about administrative issues, but, but we, we'll bring it up both. Um, of course, scientists, have you, if you have ever met a scientist who is satisfied with the level and the length of funding, then it's probably a mad person. Um, um, so, uh, th there was an interesting case when, when the um, Research Council and Formas announced the Linnaeus grants. They had an explicit statement that they anticipated the structural changes of universities. And I can see there is a fight between the universities. They have one way of of, of, of thinking and the, the, the research, the funding agencies, they want to, 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 to provoke them. So this is a really sort of a, a very important so field there, of there is tension. A very, there so is a very, very simple answer to that, a short one. Uh, uh, and it's as long as you don't actively impede and prevent interdisciplinary research, it's all right. But I'm, I have a feeling that uh, that uh, that research grant givers actually do that. 
I was, I was working, I, I spent more, the most part, of, well, the worst part of 15 years uh, in, in, in uh, research councils between 1985 and, and, and 1999. And we did that all the time. We put up hindrances, we put up rules, we put up uh, strange, uh, well, everything that pr could prevent people from doing things together. <laughs> Hanef. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think there is, there is a lot of literature indicating that interdisciplinarity very often takes longer time. So, so what you suggested yourself, that, that there could be special interdisciplinary calls where people are allowed that extra time or is definitely something that will be beneficial or to interdisciplinary work. Uh, I think it's, it's also um, often seen that young scholars trained in interdisciplinary settings may have extra challenges landing on their feet afterwards. Or, and I'm not sure what funding agencies can do, but one thing they can do is to ask some explicit questions about how is the training of graduate students and postdocs going to run, or to get, some, to get people think through before the project starts, how do you make sure that the young people you, you get into this kind of work is actually also getting something where they land on, on their feet afterwards. Or, and then finally, I would also say interdisciplinarity comes in very many different forms. It is not very, the, the easiest thing to identify is people's affiliation, but that does not necessarily say whether this is putting together different cognitive resources. There are very interdisciplinary departments where people with very different training and who usually work in very different areas suddenly get together and, and then they find out that all the interdisciplinary funding they cannot apply for because they happen to have the same address. Or so, so to make sure that calls for interdisciplinarity are, are based on putting different areas of expertise together regardless of their addresses. Or um, and as I don't want to encourage speed eating, as with research, uh, eating takes time, then I will just give you one more question and been asked for here before we go down to the restaurant. The whole restaurant is ours and we'll meet here again at one o'clock. <coughs> yeah, uh, well, I, I would say, uh, so I, my question is about how do we get more interdisciplinary research? And for the first thing, I don't think you, uh, the research councils should uh, provide grants unless they have competent people to, to evaluate the applications. But actually, I, I, I raised my hand to, to comment on uh, Hannah Anderson's um, uh, interdisciplinary education program. And a basis for university education is said to be research. So how can you create an interdisciplinary program uh, based on people that have no experience of doing interdisciplinary research themselves? That is definitely a, a challenge and, and I think the, the anecdotal evidence I presented of the program I had been involved in with, with purely or largely disciplinary researchers who didn't trust each other enough to, to really engage or in, in supervising interdisciplinary projects in, in, in a, a reasonable way or show some of, some of the problems involved in it. Or I do think that you need to, to have some kind of, of basis or in interdisciplinary work, but I also do think that there is a lot of interdisciplinary work going on at universities. So, so the important thing is to, to make your research basis also from that current research that goes on in, in interdisciplinary projects. Or for some fields that may feel challenging because those fields that are, that are built are, are very much are, you need to start out with this course 101, then 102, then 103, or it takes a long time before you can in, engage in research is, is the basic thought. There much energy needs to be put into how is it actually that you can draw students into that kind of research early on in, in the process and, and have experience of, of what goes on in those settings. Thank you. Um, 
I'm sure there are more questions, and I'd like you to remember them, write them down, think about them, and get back to them when we have the concluding discussion this afternoon. And now please, um, everybody, join us in the restaurant. Uh, buffet will be served, one o'clock, sharp. We'll start here again, thank you.